Hello, and welcome back to the podcast. This is your host, Dr. Jennifer Shaw, and we have another amazing guest joining us today on the podcast. Today, we have Janelle Gorman hopping on with us from Sedona, Arizona. (laughs) Janelle is a lifestyle transformation and female embodiment coach. Her expertise is helping women heal their parent wounds, which is a very uh, pertinent Mm -hmm. issue to me. So I'm excited to talk about it. And it, the inspiration for her diving into this journey was really her own personal experience, having lost her father at age nine. Um, And she really just helps women reclaim their power, step into their divine feminine power and really lives what she teaches. Like you can see she embodies it fully (laughs) in her life. So it is such an honor to have you on the podcast, Janelle. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so grateful to be here. Thanks for yeah. having me, Jen. I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited. So, okay. Before I even ask you to tell your story, would you do me a favor and just give the listeners kind of, I don't want to say like a definition because it's not something you can like put into a box, mm-hmm. but can you give them an idea of what you mean when you're saying parent wounds? Of course. So a lot of times I feel like, unfortunately, many of us, have not, didn't grow up with both parents being physically and emotionally present in our lives. And when one or both parents aren't present, it does do a lot of damage on us growing up because we're lacking certain things that both parents are supposed to provide for us. So for example, I work with women who have father wounds and not necessarily does their father need to not be in the picture completely, but I also work with ladies whose fathers are physically there, but emotionally totally absent from them or emotionally unavailable. And that if not, that might be worse. I mean, I feel like it's both physically not there and emotionally it's just as bad, but it does make such an impact as if your father wasn't there physically for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's key to understand is it's not necessarily that they like weren't in the physical home with you or a physical part of your life, but it's that emotional availability. Like if you were constantly seeking that attention from your parents and not getting Mm. it or felt like you had to act out in in order to get it. And, you know, it's just, there's so much that happens before we're even cognizantly aware of it. These things are developed uh, really before our teenage years. And and that's when we learn. So it's, it's super powerful. So if you can look back at your childhood and say, you know, like my, if you feel, even if your parents don't think it's true, but if you feel like your parents prioritize other children over you, or we're not, Mm -hmm. um, you know, there when you needed the emotional support or when you cried, Mm -hmm. told you to go to your room and get yourself together. Like these are things that truly impact our lives. And although I've journeyed through it, Janelle, you have an incredible story Mm -hmm. and incredible work that you do. And this is really what you your dharma, it's your purpose in life. It's what you've invested your time and energy into. So it's amazing. So for the listeners, would you share a little bit about uh, the journey that brought you to say, yes, this is the work I will do in this world? Absolutely. All right. So my father passed away when I was nine to drug abuse. I had no idea he was struggling with drug addiction until age, maybe like 10. When my father passed away, my mom told me that it was due to a heart attack, which I don't have any resentment towards her because I don't know what I would have done if I had a nine-year-old daughter and how to break the news when I had no idea. Now it makes more sense when I remember my dad always being tired and stuff, but it wasn't, it wasn't until I got into my healing journey that I was like able to put the puzzle pieces together. So I lost my dad, unfortunately, to drug abuse when I was nine. And I thought I was totally fine. I went through my like 16 years of my life in my early 20s. Like, I'm fine. Like, I'm totally fine. But I knew I was ignoring a lot. When it came to Father's Day, I just pretended like it wasn't there. And like when I got triggered, when I looked at social media, I just pretended like I was totally fine. It didn't bother me. But I knew deep down, like, as you can probably relate, when we're pretending something's not there, we feel even more. Mm -hmm. We feel like heaviness in our chest and all of that. So I went through so many of my years pretending like I was fine. And I have like a tattoo actually with my dad's death dates. And I didn't know those dates until maybe a year ago. And whenever someone would ask me, oh, when your dad passed away, I'm like, I don't know. 
what does my tattoo say? Like, I literally blocked it out. I just almost just kind of disregarded his passing altogether. And that came out I after I, like, started my healing journey, and now I help these women heal themselves and their father or mother wounds. I realized that throughout that time of me pretending that I was fine, oh, my God, it was showing up in so many destructive ways, such as, like, sex, addi- sex addiction, um, attracting toxic partners, being okay with being in physically or emotionally abusive relationships. Yeah. I didn't really have a structure of what love is and how a man is supposed to treat a woman because my father passed away when I was so young. Well, and if he had issues with drugs and, and things at that age, one would assume that he didn't have the most loving um, relationship with your mother, that you got to see what intimacy looked like, what love looked like, what support looked like, what it looked mm-hmm. like to have a, a cohesive partnership. These are the things that we're supposed to learn when our parents, much of the time, I believe, think we don't know what's going on yet, but we are l- literally imprinting in our lives the roadmap of our future relationships. Exactly. And you'll just keep repeating that. Like what, what we were taught when we were younger and our subconscious just keeps carrying that with us through, until our adult life, unless we address it. So I went through the whole, I'm not good enough, or uh, my dad left me. And I had a lot of anger towards my dad, but then I came from a place of compassion. And I realized like my, you get into, some people get into drugs for certain things. And it's not like he intentionally got into drugs for like to end his life. Or he did not road. be a good dad to you, right? It wasn't exactly. like I'm drugs so I can be a bad dad. That wasn't exactly. My dad like started using at thirteen. He grew up in Baltimore, Maryland. Yeah. Like so, it's and and his dad wasn't there for him either. Yeah. His dad was is physically and emotionally not there. And not only does it, I re- I'm realizing it's not only does it impacting women who are fatherless, but it's also impacting men who are fatherless and are afraid to commit and you know and a lot of us women are like those guys and categorize them but after healing and actually seeing guys who have do have father wounds and dating men who do have father and mother wounds I realize it's just a it's just two trauma bond or like a trauma bond relationship Mm -hmm. yeah you know no one knowing better we weren't shown that but in order for us to find ourselves and do the work, then we're able to come home to ourselves. But if we don't do the work, we're just constantly repeating this limiting belief cycle and attracting these men and asking my, yourselves, why do I always attract these men? I used to do that for the longest time. I'm like, wow, I'm the worst at picking men. But then I, now I realize it's because that's all I knew. Mm-hmm. And if there was a healthy guy or a toxic guy, my mind felt comfortable with the toxic oh yeah it was home it was all it was what your subconscious knew as familiar exactly you know being now in a very healthy relationship after spending many years in unhealthy ones especially being married to a narcissist like Mm. it took me a lot of healing and a lot of patience and a lot of communication with my partner to (laughs) be able to blossom in this relationship like the beginning three months of our relationship were so hard and not hard in the normal, like I'm seeing red flags or like I'm having to move my life in hard and like the, like, he's so nice to me. I don't know what to do. Uh, Like it was so glad you can relate. I feel this even recently. My boyfriend's like, I'm being so patient with you. I'm like, but you have to remember where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. I'm coming from all I know is toxic. Yeah. So you need a lot of patience, but I'm sure you can agree that once we, break that generational cycle and find someone who truly cares and then we realize and start programming our mind that we deserve that Mm -hmm. then it comes easy but like when I tell my clients I'm like because sometimes my clients are like there's so many nice guys I'm like but those are the guys you deserve and it's just you're not used to that so you shy away from them Mm -hmm. and it's going to be uncomfortable it's like you're going up a hill but once you get start going down that hill things start falling into place and you end up in the healthy zone yeah Yep. No, because it's an interesting journey. That's for sure. It's a, you know, when, when you look at, 
the generational things, I bring this book up a lot and I've had Mark Wolin on the podcast, the author, but it didn't start with you is, is about generational trauma and how we uh, have these bond breaking bond issues with our mothers and how we have these generational traumas we're getting from our great grandparents, our grandparents, you know, different people in the family. And, and it's a really powerful thing to, to understand. So then it's like, okay, I know this information. I know. So, so my thing was, I was a very uh, difficult child. I cried a lot. Mm. I didn't sleep a lot. I was very challenging. And my parents will both say that, but I feel as though like my mother's always had resentment towards me for it. And it's carried over in many other ways. And I didn't really put these pieces together until like probably this last year. And now I've had to put some very serious mm. boundaries in place to protect my energy so I can heal. Uh, and it's, it's a hard thing to do. Right. But it's like, Absolutely. when you start to look at those patterns, you're like, okay, I see them. Got it. Awareness. This is important. But well, what the hell do I do from here? Right. And um, I have seen therapists. I have worked with somatic experience therapists, traditional talk therapists. Like I've done a lot of that work. I've also worked with coaches uh, and mm. spiritual leaders and, and things to, to heal. There's so many different options out there. And I know oh, you've experienced a lot of the different things out there. When you're talking to somebody who's like, saying like, okay, I see what you guys are all saying. I know that I'm effed up in the head from this and I don't know where to go. Like, will you explain kind of some of the options and maybe why somebody would choose to work with a therapist versus why they would work with a coach and like when to lean in either Absolutely. direction? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I've been in therapy since I was three. Like my mom put me in therapy when I was three because I think I had I've dealt with so much trauma and she's like, let me just, and then my mom always said like, I belong in Hollywood because I was always so dramatic. But then I think back and like, mm. and like you said, I, I am a firm believer of like, we picked our, we chose our lives. Yeah. I know some people may be opposite, but it's like, this is my purpose. No matter how much my dad's passing affected me in the long run and scheme of things, maybe almost even wanting to end my life. I was able to embody that and come out on the bright side of helping other women. So when it comes to therapy versus a coach, I mean, I still see I still see my therapist once a month, but I see I talk to her just to like conversate. I, that's the way I know going into the conversation, like my therapy sessions, I know it's like I'm just going to update and just have someone like outside hear me and let me vent at times. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to me and coaching my clients, I always tell them that think of a scenario like they're starting to crawl, but I want them to start walking. So I take them throughout this two to three month program and get them the tools needed so they can start walking on their own. So they won't need me. And it's hard when I get to the end of the course and I'm like, Meh, like, I, like I'm going to miss them, but I know that they have the tools to keep going on by themselves. Mm. And sometimes I feel like in therapy, we focus more on the how we feel right now, yeah. as opposed to the tools that are needed. I know some therapists are like amazing with that. But when I take my clients through the journey, we'll do breath work, we do meditations, we do um, letter burning, burn ceremonies, mm -hmm. we do all of that stuff. So we can also like cut the cord of that past. Yeah. Because it's not for us to relive the past. It's for us to understand it, let it go and then focus on falling in love with ourselves. Hmm. Yeah. You know, so I look at it like as a coach, like I'm here to help you start walking, mm -hmm. even though it's going to be like, it's like bittersweet. Like it's sadness when I, like, I just finished my last, my mastermind last week, my eight week mastermind course, fabulous daughter mastermind. And I was so sad, but then I'm like, but I know these ladies have learned so much and they have the tools. And that was my intention for when I'm a coach. Like my intention is give ladies the tools that are needed. So they don't need me anymore. Yeah. Yep. So it's almost like <laughs> teaching them how to be independent uh, and, and then having the therapist too, if you, you choose or that benefits you at this time to kind of walk with you along the entire journey where you're going to teach them to walk exactly. and then say, yeah. And then the therapist is going to walk with them throughout the journey because healing's never done, you know, as we oh, no. <laughs> dive deeper into like getting into a relationship 
following my divorce was hard because mm. my first marriage was a duplicate of what I learned in childhood. And now this relationship is like nothing I've ever experienced. So I'm mm. like, okay, it's all so foreign. It's also new. Now we're like moving in together. And I'm like, it's also foreign. It's also new. Okay. Like, and all I know is I've lived with one person, my ex-husband and it was traumatic. So mm-hmm. it's like this, it's hard thing of like, I'm learning, but I always come back. Here's where it's cool with a coach like you is I always come back to the tools that I've learned from my coaches. I go back to my meditation. I go back to my communication skills that I learned. I go back to my visualizations. I go back to my journaling, right? Mm-hmm. I go back to the burning inner therapy. child. All yeah, the that. inner child work. I deserve this. I am safe, mm-hmm. you know, because it's hard. hard. Absolutely. I deal with that too. And sometimes I see myself in this relationship trying to self-sabotage and I'm like, I need to not do that. It's just because it's so foreign to me Mm -hmm. that I'm like, I can't do that to myself. I deserve this. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, it's definitely um, an interesting, interesting journey to be on. And then one of the things I kind of want to talk about is like, it, it doesn't necessarily mean our parents were bad like my parents both loved me right Mm -hmm. but even with the love they were loving me the best they knew how from what they knew from their parents right like I always kind of say this in I say in different ways but it's the same concept is like we spend so much of our adult life unlearning what we were taught by people (laughs) who were still trying to figure it out Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Our parents are just people. Like they're nothing. I know sometimes like we always, I feel growing up, it's like mother, father. And you like put them on a pedestal. Like, I mean, cause we're young and that's all, who we look up to. Those are our caregivers. And when we don't have one of them, we feel like we weren't good enough. And when we have both, and if they're not there for us, that we, the way we would love them to be, yeah, we still feel not enough. But like you said, I always tell my clients that, especially when it comes to their fathers who are absent in their life. One of my clients met their father and like after years and years and years of never meeting them and they're, I'm like, okay, well, was your dad, do you think he had it all together? And she was like, hell no. And I was like, okay, so let's take that and let's realize that if someone doesn't have it all together for themselves, they can't have it all together for their daughter. Mm-hmm. So it has nothing to do with you, but a lot of fatherless daughters blame themselves. Like I wasn't good enough. That's why he didn't show up. I wasn't enough. I may have just, I was created in just a hookup, like, yeah. but it has nothing to do with you. It has all to do with them, mm-hmm. yep. you know? And especially with it, when you do have your parents there, like you said, they did the best they could. And sometimes if it's not enough, try and look deeper as opposed to just surface level, look deeper and think, what was my parents' upbringing? How were my grandparents? Because mm-hmm. a lot of it, as you know, it's generational. And that's why we're here to break those generational cycles. Exactly, girlfriend. Like my with us. future children will not have the same experience. No way. Will I fuck them up in some way? Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. We all do, right? But Absolutely, we're not perfect. Learn what unconditional love is? I hope so. Absolutely right will they be a good example of and I it's so interesting talking about the breaking of generational patterns is I I wanted children since I was like in my late 20s I didn't want them in my early 20s but I wanted children as I got to like my late 20s and then I was in my first marriage and I was so fully aware that I did not want to bring children into that environment I just knew there was nothing positive that could come out of that. And I consciously chose to not have children. And it was interesting when I got with my, my boyfriend, we had asked each other, do you want kids? I was like, if I'm in the right partnership. And he was like, that's my answer. And I was like, well, I think that's the mature answer to have. It's like, I'm not going to have children just because I want to be a mother. I'm going to have children. If I can have children in a loving and a supporting environment where they are provided for, like I am intentionally going to bring children into this world. Um, and that's something I can do to break generational trauma and generational patterning, right? Exactly. I'm like a huge believer of conscious parenting. 
Mm-hmm. And my mastermind has even helped my the women who do have kids, how yeah. they act, how they are with their kids. Yeah, absolutely. they're more aware now. It's not like a lot of us grow up and our parents could be like, oh, don't cry. You're fine. You're fine. Mm-hmm. And that just teaches us when we get older to suppress our emotions. Exactly. But that's not the way. It's like I always say, feel to heal. Yeah. Feel those emotions sure so they this- don't get stuck in your yeah. body. I have a sweatshirt that says it's okay to feel your feelings. Like it's totally feel them. Okay. Cry. My boyfriend bought it for me. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Our friend Crystal is the one that had it and he saw it and then knew I'd love it and he bought it for me for Christmas. So he's such oh, a Oh, that's sweet. One. Okay. That's so super fast, because I, I just want to know, like, real quick, I want you to not think too hard and just see what comes to mind. What has been the most imperative thing you have done on this healing journey with your father wounds? Like if you could say one thing that has absolutely been the most important, you wouldn't be where you were without it. What would it be? Boundaries. Setting boundaries with myself and not being a people pleaser. Because in those toxic relationships that I was in, I would literally say yes to things that I knew my, it wasn't a full body. Yes. But I would say yes, because I wanted them to stay and not leave me. Yeah. And now since I've been in my healing journey, boundaries have been everything because I realize I'm complete with or without. Yeah. Yep. I love yeah. myself. And if you stay, you stay. And if you go, you go. One of my biggest fears has always been abandonment. Same. And it's interesting. There's a lot of generational things and familial things that have to do with the abandonment. And I've, um, it has been shown to me to be a true fear, Right. But when I really look at the, the fear of abandonment, what I found was all of the people I was afraid would abandon me. As I got more powerful in my boundaries, I walked away from them. They didn't abandon mm. me. I made a conscious choice to say that they were not um, going to have as much accessibility to me so that I could have more powerful boundaries to keep myself emotionally and physically safe, right? Right. And that's so crazy when we can get real clear and intentional with boundaries. Oh, I got to do another podcast episode on boundaries. I love so, it's so them. real. And I'm, I look at it like there's internal and external boundaries. We have boundaries that we set within ourselves. Maybe like an example could be like, I'm on social media too much. I'm just going to do like an hour or two a day. That's a boundary set with ourselves internally. And then we have external boundaries, which is what we set with others. So not only do I focus on boundaries just with others, but I also focus boundaries that within myself and commitments I make to myself. So beautiful. Ah, I Mm -hmm. love, love, love it. Okay, girl, we're going to dive into the rapid fire questions. Are you ready? Let's do it. I'm so ready. What is your number one health and wellness tip for the listeners? Mm -hmm. I say work on your mind, body, and spirit. Um, Me being an ex-bikini competitor and bodybuilder, I was so focused on just my material, like the, my physical aspect that my mind, I was still dealing with so much trauma within. So if you make sure you're good on mind, body, and spirit all at once, that's how you become more aligned within yourself. Yeah. And it's got to be multifaceted like that. Cause otherwise the pizza pie is uneven. Exactly. <laughs> okay. What is one health and wellness uh, habit or, or um, just, tip that you feel like you struggle with that you're not as consistent as you would like to be I would say meditation for sure because I know how good it is for you but I also sometimes find myself or actually almost always find myself having a hard time to get into that state of sitting down and just relaxing sometimes I'm just go 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 and worrying about all these things in my day and it's like if I just sit and become silent and just sit with myself my days would be so much better because when I do it, it makes such a difference. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of us, and like Deepak Chopra says, if you feel like you have a hard time meditating once, you should be meditating twice a day. Yeah. Yeah. You need it more. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the things we resist, exactly. things we need. I love it. Okay. What are you most excited about in life right now? I would say my business and helping women transform their lives to finding themselves and realizing that they don't need either parent or any parent to feel whole and complete. We need us to love ourselves. Oh, that's all we need. You know, if we don't have both parents, we're still enough, more than enough. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Absolutely. I love, 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 love it. Okay. <laughs> My selfish question, because I'm a bookworm. What is your favorite book? I like the emotion code. Oh, take it girl. Out right now. This I is so amazing. Code. So I've been doing emotion code on myself for about a year now. And now oh. my dear friend became emotion code practitioner. And nice. I've been doing sessions with her and it is game changing. Oh my God. The healing oh, I am so. doing, releasing these emotions is insane. And just learning about things like, we can have like trapped emotions for years and years and years. And that's why it's so important to feel the heal, like in order to feel to heal, because if not, those emotions get stuck within either like we don't, us not letting go and not releasing them. Yeah. And like, when I read this book, I'm like, oh my God, this makes so much sense. Like right? we really do. That's why it's so important. Just like whatever emotion comes, like feel it. Don't just push bypass it because that gets stored in, in with it, like gets stored in our bodies and allows less space for good things to come in. Yeah. And as we talk about like reproducing and having children, those emotions that are stuck in us can be passed to our children. Mm -hmm. so we need yeah. to do that healing. Oh, I love the emotion code. Good, so good. recommendation. Girl. So good. Okay. Uh, where can people find you? Amazing. So you can find me on Instagram at Janelle.Gorman, G-E-N-E-L-L dot g-o-r-m-a-n and also i do um host masterminds every couple months and you can find more details on that at fatherlessdaughtermastermind.com definitely yeah go check out her instagram she always posts incredible content some fun <laughs> things to follow Thanks. along with um, and just learn more. Maybe your interest got peaked and you're like, I don't know if I have any of this going on, but check it out. She's got great free resources and I know her For paid sure. stuff is awesome. I also know that you and my dear friend, Crystal, have an amazing retreat coming up in Sedona. We in do, we do, we so. do. It's in January of 2022 in Sedona, Arizona. So one guys, of the most spiritual places in the world. Yeah, it's and amazing. if you guys want to know more about that, she's got tons up on her Instagram. So go check it out, Janelle Gorman. It's one N, two L's. Um, and definitely check out the podcast and learn more about this amazing lady. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast, Janelle. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure. I appreciate mm, it. Such a good conversation. I so appreciate you. And I look forward to our continued conversation uh, until next time, listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. Namaste. Namaste.